Welcome to Law Sessions. I am Jennifer Housen. In this Law Session, we will consider acceptance and we will also consider certainty of terms and the intention to create legal relations, all in this session. In the previous lecture, uh, I looked at offer and I also drew a distinction between an offer and an invitation to treat and just by way of background what contract law is. So this lecture is somewhat of a continuation to that. Now, once you have an offer that has been accepted, a binding contract is made, and of course, that ends the offer. So acceptance together with the offer amounts to a, uh, an agreement. Now, Tritle defines acceptance as a final unqualified expression of assent to all of the terms of an offer. Now, acceptance is subject to an objective test, which is very similar to offers, which also require an objective test. So it similarly here apply in the same manner. So in other words, evidence must be produced from which the courts can adduce that an intention by the offeree to accept the offer communicated to them, you must show that in the context of an offer and acceptance situation. Now, two principles which evolve from the definition of acceptance and the requirements of this um, objective uh, existence are, first of all, the expression of an intention to assent to the offer must be there, as seen in the case of Taylor and Leard, and it must be in response to the offer, and it must match the terms of the offer precisely. Now, the acceptance must be unequivocal and unconditional, because if it is an equivocal uh, acceptance, or if the response is equivocal, or if there is a condition attached, as we will see later, that will not amount to an acceptance. Rather, it may very well have the effect of either getting rid of the offer or just having no effect at all on the offer. The second, of course, is that simply acknowledging the offer is not enough. There must be a communication of the acceptance to the offeror. Now, a counteroffer amounts to a rejection of the original offer, and this is what I was alluding to earlier. So in Hyde and Wrench, the defendant had made a written offer to sell his farm to the plaintiff for a thousand pounds. Now, this is back in 1840. Now, the plaintiff replied that he would give him 950 pounds for it. Now, the defendant refused to sell at the lower price, and a few days later, the plaintiff wrote to him saying, well, I'm agreeing now. So the defendant wrote to the, uh, the plaintiff wrote to the defendant agreeing to pay a thousand pounds for the property. By that time, of course, the defendant had decided he didn't want to sell anymore, so he withdrew his original offer. He refuses to sell to the plaintiff, and the court said that there was no contract. The plaintiff's counter offer of 900 and 50 pounds was a rejection of the defendant's original offer and brought it to an end. It could not be revived afterwards by the plaintiff simply purporting to accept it. How this translates on an exam generally, of course, is that the examiner will write, will say something like, um, X is selling his computer and X tells Y that he's selling the computer for a thousand pounds. The examiner will then, of course, put in a sort of chain of events which show that Y, for example, responded to X and said something along the lines of, um, I've got 950 pounds. But you have to watch exactly the words used in the exams. Now, one of the important things, as I've mentioned before, uh, in the previous lecture is that it is for you to determine what the status of each communication is. Never leave it to the examiner to tell you what it is. So the examiner might say, 
X is selling his computer for a thousand pounds. Paul accepted and said, said that he will give him 950 pounds. Well, that isn't an acceptance because that's not what it was being sold for. So what you need to do is look at what it is and then, of course, explain it to the extent that what we see from the offeree is potentially a counter offer. It may very well, as later on when we come to it, it may very well be that um, the offeree writes back and says to X, um, would you be willing to accept two che post-dated checks? Well, it will be for you to discuss whether that is a counter offer or as we'll see later, if it could be of some other type of status. Now then, there are situations where the offeree does not put forward a new proposal, but merely seeks clarification of the offer or he seeks further information about it from the offeror. In such a case, the offer is not to be regarded as rejected and it is still open for the offeree to accept it. Now, this, of course, could be, can be seen in the case of Stevenson and McLean. And the idea is that Stevenson and McLean stands for the proposition that if it is that the offeree is simply asking a question, then this will not have the hide and wrench effect of killing off the original offer. So what you need to do is to look at what the examiner has said to you and determine, is it an acceptance or is it a counter offer if it is that it is an well if is it is it an acceptance based on the fact that he is simply requesting information then it will not amount to a counter offer so if the examiner were to give you a scenario whereby he says that x offers his computer to y for a thousand pounds y wrote back saying I would not be able to buy it unless I am able to pay for it three months from now. You have to watch that very carefully because if he's saying he wouldn't be able to buy it otherwise, that may very well be a counter offer. But if he said, would you be willing to accept two payments that may be a Stevenson and McLean situation because he's not suggesting that he can't buy it. He's asking, maybe looking for a good deal uh, in terms of keeping his money, is whether or not he may consider two payments. But what you need to do is to discuss it and then you need to make submissions. Remember that in law, there is no right or wrong answer. What needs to be right is the rule that you're using, the principle you're using must be right. But as to the outcome, it is entirely what you suggest it is. Now, in a unilateral contract, the offeree signifies acceptance by conduct. So performance of the act or the condition stipulated in the offer, that will amount to acceptance. So in Carlisle and Carbolic Smokeball, the court rejected the argument that a plaintiff had failed to notify the defendant company offer acceptance of their offer before using the product. The court said that she accepted by buying the smoke ball and using it as instructed and by claiming the reward after catching influenza, she was entitled to succeed. Now in a bilateral contract, acceptance may be signified by words or documents or by the conduct of the parties. Whether an offer is unilateral or bilateral may be a matter of debate and it should not be supposed that the distinction is unproblematic. We have seen cases uh, where this has caused some problems. Uh, one, of course, that I would flag up is Brogdon and Metropolitan Railway Company, an 1877 case. Now, Brogdon had supplied the Metropolitan Railway Company with coal for some years without any formal agreement. Well, the parties decided to formalize their transactions and the Metropolitan Railway Company sent Brogdon a draft agreement. Brogdon completed certain details in the draft which had been left blank, including the name of an arbitrator. B then signed it, Mr. Brogdon signed it, and he wrote approved and returned it to the Metropolitan Railway Company. The manager got it and placed it in his desk. 
Nothing further was done formally with the document, but for some time after that, of course, the parties acted in accordance with the arrangements by Mr. Brogdon supplying the coal and the Metropolitan Railway Company paying for the coal. Of course, as happens normally, a disagreement arose and Brogdon denied that there was a binding contract between the parties. Well, the addition of the arbitrator's name by Brogdon was a new term and therefore a counteroffer. The question was, did the Metropolitan Railway Company accept this offer? It might be thought that by putting the document into the manager's desk was an equivocal act incapable of amounting to a valid acceptance. But no objection was made to the terms which was suggested by Mr. Brogdon. Instead, what the company did was to place an order for the coal and then he delivered the coal. The fact is that when he changed or when he added terms and sent it back, when the first lot of coal was delivered and the railway company accepted it, they more or less accepted the terms within that document. And so that is the, one of the ways, certainly, where conduct on uh, the party's part will certainly amount to acceptance. Now, Lord Kearns in the case said that approbation was clearly given when the company commenced a course of dealing which is referable only to the contract and when that course of dealing was accepted and acted upon by Mr. Brogdon in the supply of coal, then of course we had a binding agreement coming into force. We have noted that an acceptance to be valid should show an unqualified assent to the terms of the offer. It should not introduce new proposals or stipulations. This is the position in theory, but in practice, business people may try to exploit the process of offering acceptance so as to contract on their own standard terms. Well, the leading case in this area, of course, is Butler Machine Tool and XLO. It is the battle of the form cases. And the idea is that one party will draft or use rather his standard form contract the other party will respond on his standard form contract. The party then sends back on his standard form contract and it goes on and on, hence the battle of the forms. The point, of course, is that it is the last form, the last contract on which the parties then start dealing which will bind the parties. So if I send an order over, um, uh, so a purchase order, and you respond with an invoice and on my purchase order had my terms and conditions. So let's say for argument's sake, my purchase order say that I pay in 30 days. You send over an invoice. Your invoice says payment is required in 15 days. I then send back my final order as it were. And it says again, I pay in 30 days. Based on that, you then decide to deliver the goods. Well, the law says that because the last form with the terms on it was my form, I will be able to settle in 30 days. What about the communication of acceptance? Well, as a general principle, acceptance must be communicated to the offeror if it is to lead to a binding agreement. The offeree must do no more than simply make an uncommunicated decision to accept an offer. So in Brogden, as we've mentioned, we see there that it was not the decision of the respondent company's manager to accept the amended draft contract that concluded the agreement with the appellant, but rather the ordering of the coal and the subsequent course of dealings between the parties. Now, an acceptance may be by words, spoken or written, or by conduct, but mere silence is insufficient to bind. The law takes an objective view of agreement and some external evidence beyond a mental resolution is generally required for there to be a valid acceptance. Now, if a particular form of, form of acceptance is requested by the offeror, then generally the offeree must comply with that request. Now, although there is a need to communicate acceptance to the offeror, what amounts to a communicated acceptance depends on the types of cases we are considering. Furthermore, in unilateral contracts, the offeror does not request a counter-promise from the offeree. He asks for performance of some act or acts, as we have seen in, carbolic, uh, in Carlisle and Carbolic Smokeball. And again, 
you know what that co uh, case said what though is the position if the offer weighs the requirement of communication um, uh, communicated acceptance and the offeree thinking that silence will amount to a valid acceptance does nothing further well that is a point we will consider immediately after the break mm -hmm.